Uh, welcome to, um, I think most of you don't know why you're here, so feel free to stand up and leave once you find out who we are. Uh, I'm Steve Bollier, this is Red Sea Bruno, we own Aethon Books together. Aethon Books is a um, science fiction fantasy publisher. We started about three years ago, and um, uh, we don't... We don't have a lot of answers, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna rely on some questions at some point. But um, you know, the, the subject matter here is how can I stand up? I can't see anyone or anyone. Hey. Um, yeah. Project is sitting at a table while talking. Um, so we started about three years ago. Um, we just love books. We love writing books. We're authors. How many of our authors in the room? Almost everyone. No. There's audio narrators here. If you're an audio narrator here, oh, Pavi is the only, no, I'm just kidding. I know there's a lot of narrators here. Um, so we, uh, we started this publishing company with an author first mentality. A lot of our authors are in here. I would hope that that rings true. And you don't need to shake your head or nod your head, especially if you're shaking your head. I don't, <laughs> don't need the pain right now. Um, but we started it because we were authors. We, Rhett was a Random House author before he sort of went indie. Um, we, we tend to call it hybrid more than, than indie uh, because we believe in a partnership with the Trad Pub folks um, as much as we do believe in being independent and being in control of what you're doing. But hey, as publishers, we know that not every person that writes books wants to be an authorpreneur. Um, I think that there's a good reason why a lot of you folks are here. You want to learn the business side of this. But I'm also going to say that after doing this for several years, um, I think that many of you will go home and go, I want nothing to do <laughs> with all that business stuff that was talked about. And so that's why people like Brett and I exist, is because we, uh, we learned how to sell our own books. And we looked at each other one day and we said, if we know how to sell our own books, do we know how to sell other people's books? And I'll be honest, we found out very quickly the answer was yes. Um, and it's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I was a pastor for 15 years, um, which was very, very hard. I'm a father, uh, I'm a husband. I think selling books in the capacity that we do it is one of the most difficult things that I've ever been a part of. Um, and a lot of that is because authors come to us trusting us to do a job that they, in many cases, themselves have already failed to do. And they're going, okay, I don't know how to do this. I'm hoping you know how to do this. And a lot of times the answers are not write a better book. <laughs> Authors, I, I want to tell you right now, your books don't sell because they're good. Okay, They sell because you marketed them properly. They get good reviews because they're good. And hopefully those good reviews lead to sustainability in your sales. But initially speaking, the, the problem might be in your marketing more than it is in your writing. So like for, for a second, breathe, because I think this, this conference is full of folks who have written books and they just think they suck, or they're not good authors, but the reality is you might have the greatest book ever, but if nobody sees it, you're gonna sell it. Our job as publishers is to learn how to make people see your book. Your job is to write a good book. Now, many of you are here, if you're here because you're thinking about starting a publishing company, raise your hand. Okay. There's that. There's that thing. So the challenge here. For yourself here, or others. That's yeah. For yourself or for your. If if it's just for you, you want to start a publishing imprint mainly just to publish yourself. Raise your hand. Okay. If if you're thinking about publishing other people, raise your hand. I should probably get the emails of all your authors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me let me start with this really basic, simple challenge that we have here. We're a publishing company, and you're asking us to teach you how to do our job so that you could do your job and <laughs> take away, right? That makes no sense. So we're going to look at this in, a, in whatever frame we have to look at it in, in order to make this beneficial for you, but also me not sitting up here and Rhett sitting up here and going, here's how to do what we do, and then us go, hey, we have no job now, <laughs> right? Publishing is not easy. If you think there's ease to it, let me back up. If you have not been successful writing your own books and you want to start a publishing company, stop it. It's not easier to do it for other people in any capacity. I think a lot of times we have people come up to us, they want to start a publishing company, and then we look at their sales history and we go, why do you think you could do it for someone else? Some people think it's, a better, it's another stream of income, but like, it's only a stream of income if you know how to do it. And, and it, it's very hard, you know, there's 300 million books a, a month published on Amazon. 
It's a massive number. I think it's 1.6 billion a year, and the average book makes like 12 bucks. We've had agents come to us to, to agent other people and their authors themselves, and we look at their sales history, and that agent has sold 12 books, and they have a whole series. And Rhett and I go, and this is no offense meant to anybody, we look at this and we go, I could do that by accident while I'm sleeping. How do you not sell 12 books over the course of several years? So if that is you, um, let me encourage you to find something else right now. Let's find out how to sell your books. We'll figure that out with you. And, and a lot of the times the answer has to do with data, right? Uh, you've, has anyone heard, you've been in any of the talks on data here yet? Data is one of the most important things that we deal with. We're not selling books to people. Authors, you're not selling books to people. You're selling books to a machine that is selling books to people. You're selling to data before you're selling to human beings. Human beings are ultimately where you're going, but we're talking about Amazon, we're talking about Kobo, we're talking about these different sellers that all rely upon data to find who buys your book. I'm talking this whole time. You can talk. No, if you, <laughs> if you want to take it. Um, no. So, I mean, we should probably talk to them about being a small press. <laughs> a little bit. For sure, but um, there's a foundation, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe I said it. Did I set a foundation? Yeah, I think you did. Cool. So, I think for us, looking back, there's been a ton of small presses that got really big like 10 years ago. And the first thing we ran into, and myself as an author, a lot of small presses are started by people who love to read. That is the last person that you want to run your small press. You need to sell books. Um, so you'll see us and a lot of other small presses, it's authors. And that used to be a, a taboo thing, right? A small press was owned by an author and that they were creating it to publish themselves and it was bad. Um, there's been a while we didn't put our names on our website because while well, indies don't care about that, we are not an indie versus trad tech place. We publish everyone. We don't really care what your background is if we can sell your book and you like your book and stuff like that, so that's not us. But agents might look at our website and say, oh, they started it to publish themselves. And they're not gonna take the two seconds to research and find that we work with other publishers. Or even for us, we are primarily as ourselves, Audible authors. And some might not look at that, some agents might not look at that as a primary format or something and not realize that yeah, we're doing deals directly with Audible and stuff. So we were authors that did stuff on our own and learned how to sell. And that is something that wasn't normal for small presses for a while. And now the small presses you see selling on Amazon, probably all are authors that have sold. Why? Why were we able to start Athon? Because we had a lot of connections. And that's not something everyone who just decides a smart to start a small press is gonna have. We knew a lot of authors in our genres. Again, we don't step beyond science fiction and fantasy. That's what we know how to sell. We've experimented here and there. We don't know how to sell the other genres. We don't try to pretend we do. And we don't have connections in those other genres. And that's a big, big part of this, um, was building connections to other authors, audio publishers, print distributors, things to get different sub rights going. And that's something that's not gonna be really afforded to any, to everyone, uh, especially if you haven't <coughs> built your career up yourself. So that's why you're seeing a lot of newer small presses are coming from authors because they have the connections to be able to compete in a marketplace that, like you said, Amazon is all data. And that's why we know how to sell our certain things. We know how to hit those data points and work with people that can help us hit the algorithm and all the things I'm sure you've heard about. And it's definitely not easy. And the one thing, I mean, I we meet with a lot of best-selling authors who want to go into publishing, try and then give up fast, because the one thing that no one's ready for is that like 50% of your books are gonna fail. And it's really easy to be happy with authors that are your best selling authors. It's not as easy to tell them, hey, your book, it didn't sell. Like, we tried as best as we could, but it just didn't stick. And that's not something everyone is prepared for, and it's not something everyone thinks about. But, you know, if you're gonna do like 10 books a year, it's probably not as much of an issue, but as we do like 200 books a year, we're a pretty big, small press, a lot of those are gonna fail because like you said, out of 1.6 whatever bids, <coughs> most of them do fail. And you know, even with us, you get the leg up of us knowing what to do with marketing and, and things like that, but still a lot of things are gonna fail. And that's something not everyone is prepared for when they're gonna start a publisher. It's the hardest thing I've had to deal with, honestly. Uh, I told you I was a pastor for 15 years before this. I'm a people person, I love 
people, I love our authors, I love all of those that we work with. Hardest thing for me to do is go to an author and discuss to, with them why their four book series didn't do anything. Um, you know, the, the answer is always, look, this is all that we did. We put a lot of money in, we lost a lot of money, right? I don't always say we lost a lot of money, but the reality is, we don't, we don't treat one author better than another, and that's another thing I think a small publisher needs to have in their mind, is that just because somebody is bigger than the other person, the bigger person might need actually less help than the little person, right? And so you have to put, there's a lot of money that goes into it. Uh, we started Aethon Books on $4,000 Kickstarter. $4,000 yeah. Kickstarter and some audio advances. Correct. Um, we were lucky enough to sign a big author named Paul Peter Jones, who passed away, but like that really helped us start by getting a name like that. And again, that's something a small press needs. I see a lot of small presses trying to start with a bunch of debut authors. They're really, really hard to sell. Uh, to bring a new name into this really competitive market, especially in certain genres. So that, you know, having that initial roster of pretty big names, and our initial roster was pretty big. It was yeah. some trad authors. Our initial roster was, was us. Uh, although I don't think we branded our books, Aethon books, at the start. We wanted to make sure, again, like he said, we didn't want to look like a vanity press. But we also wanted to, I, I have the attitude that if I'm not willing to do it for myself, I shouldn't be doing it for anybody else. And he came to me, he's like, that's not how traditional publishing looks at this. And I go, well, I don't, I don't know what that means. But like, we have to sort of prove we can do it for ourselves. Since then, Red and I have gone on, we have deals with Blackstone and different things. And, um, and so we like to sort of diversify, but we had us, we had a, a, a lady named Haley Stone who wrote Make Me No Grave, which was one of the better selling West, weird westerns I probably think ever. Um, a very, very difficult genre. I don't know why we started with such a freaking difficult book. But I'll be honest, at the start, he knew Haley, and uh, they were both published at Random House together, and they both sort of had similar experiences. Um, just to kind of explain his situation, I'm gonna do it for him because I don't think he really likes to talk about this. <laughs> um, Random House, his Random House was, a, was, it was a failure, it was a flop. It was a book series, book one was called Titanborn. Well, Rhett took that back and published it himself, and I mean, I don't know, would have sold hundreds and something thousand copies of that. Probably overall, um, um, treating you know, it like a series. And again, we are, you know, we're not anti-traditional publishing, it's just, they do certain things better than us, and we really do approach this in a very traditional style. Our contracts are pretty traditional in the way we approach royalties and stuff like that, even advances, but, you know, there's just certain things they can't compete with in digital, and again, most, like, most small presses don't have print distribution, and we don't try to pretend we can compete in that market, so we do focus very digitally, and this random house, they couldn't really compete in the digital focus, digital only, because of pricing issues and things that they can't do that the indies can do. Um, so I didn't blame them, I learned a ton, right. but it was sort of getting those rights back to what kind of kick-started us thinking, like, let's try and do this ourselves. Um, let's try to bring some other authors we know have been through similar things. Like Haley was in the same imprint as I was, and the imprint shut down, because it was doing poorly, and so we brought her over. Paul Anthony Jones was a 47 North author, which is like the dream publisher. And for some reason, even though he had a hit with them, like traditional publishing, they didn't want his next thing. Um, because again, we're as indies, we can be pretty author first, and if someone does well with us, we're just gonna keep wanting to work with them. And it's a little different on the traditional side, so they didn't want to work with them, so we did. So you know, it was knowing people up front that really helped us. Yeah, and we had Joshua faster. Gayu, which was one of, I mean, probably one of the biggest ACX authors alive, and we, we took his series with us. Um, but beyond that, the, uh, the challenge that I would say to anybody who's starting a publisher or wanting to start a publisher is ask yourself if you could be an honest and integral person. Um, because there's a lot of dishonesty in this business. Rhett and I give talks and we walk away going, damn, we just disappointed a huge number of people. <laughs> and, and it's hard to end these kinds of talks on a positive note because there's so much disinformation, it's a trigger word these days, right? But there's so much disinformation in the author and writing and publishing community because no one really wants to admit certain things. Like for instance, some of the biggest authors alive have no idea why their books sold. They'll release a series where they can sell a million copies of a book and that probably is an exaggeration and then they do a new series and it's 
it just flops. And they don't know why. Because they don't, they don't, they're not data driven in the same way that we are. We are the guys that scour Amazon and Audible all day long and we try to understand why particular people sold. And, and generally, you can figure that stuff out. You can figure out, well, 2011 was a lot easier to sell books than 2021, and there was a massive hit they had in 2011. And sometimes, yeah, a book bub that hit in 2014 launched this series to a degree, and then their next series was a failure. And so as a publisher, you need to understand sort of who you're dealing with. And I don't mean that you don't need to go to them and tell them why they're horrible or anything like that, but you need to know that just because they have one book with 20,000 ratings, look at the other book with 140 ratings or 20 ratings and go, okay, there's something happened here and you're not gonna just have a huge hit because this person, uh, readers don't follow authors. I don't know if you know that. Readers do not follow authors. They, now, we, there, are, there are outliers and that's a very blanket statement, but readers follow series. We can tell you that with almost every author we have, readers follow series. Rick, can I pick on you for a second? Of course, you Rick, Rick, Rick's one of our biggest authors. Rick is uh, one of our biggest authors and one of the biggest military sci-fi authors alive. If you follow military sci-fi, you have heard Rick Partlow's name. Rick has written 48 books or something to that degree. 49. 49 books now. Okay. He's had failures. He started. Okay. <laughs> he's had failures. He's had successes. He's had successes before us. He's had a lot of successes with us. But he has one series called Drop Trooper. Uh, the Drop Trooper series, I have, with no holds barred, told him he's writing until he dies or Jesus comes back. <laughs> okay? Why? Because it is a fascinating success to watch. Uh, he's got other series that have done very, very well. Would love for him to continue those as well, but like when you hit that series, you keep going with it. And as a publisher, you have to know all of those things and, and hedge bets and understand, and the author might come to you and go, well, this series ends at three books, and you go, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Figure it out. I like killed the guy. Bring him back to life. <laughs> I don't know if you want, but it's military sci-fi. Somebody invented something to bring him back to life. He's got it, you know, like, so there are things that you just have to be able to talk to your authors about and be honest about with them. And they might think that they just rewrote, you know, like, I don't know, the holy top, like the holy text. And you're like, no, you didn't. Rick said something to me the other night, again, I'm gonna pick on him. He said, I just think authors sometimes think that their words are more valuable than they are. And as somebody who's so successful and amazing as him, I was so pleased to hear him say that because that's a key to making money in this industry is realizing that sometimes you look at a sentence and you go, it may not be perfect, but I've wasted so much time on this that I need to move on and readers are not picking apart every sentence in my book. Right, and so like as a publisher, I was, I, is it okay that I shared that? I was just overjoyed to hear him say that because we get authors send in finished documents that have gone through editing and then all of a sudden they've added seven chapters and you're like, bro, this book's done. <laughs> well, I know, but this plot hole or whatever, I'm like, well, no, the, the editor didn't see the plot hole, so there was no plot hole. Well, yeah, but it could have been this. Well, we paid the editor and the book's done and it's on the slot and it's ready to go. And there's so much pain as a, a publisher when you go to bed at night and you know that this person's not happy with the way that the release went because we couldn't add these 42 paragraphs to chapter 18 or you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right? I, I, so I'm gonna go opposite of him. Now we have, so three books, we want him to do 20. Most of what we run into is people pitching 12 books. True. And my response to them is no, you have three because no one's gonna do more than three until it sells. And that's a very tough conversation for a lot of authors who have planned out the multi-world 12 book series. But if the first three, even if the first one doesn't sell, they're basically going, if they wanna make money in publishing, that's a different, if you're doing it for passion, or whatever you want, you know, and we'll sell it as best as we can. If you, and most of our authors, they wanna be full-time authors. If that's your goal, you can't come in with a 12 book plan series that you're not gonna abandon if it doesn't sell because you're gonna write the whole thing and make nothing. And something that we believe in is we, we don't just like sign authors and then they're just signed. Like we are constantly giving career advice, talking with them, and sometimes those conversations are hard because some of these authors, they might not have any experience to know that that's not smart or know, like hey, start with three, then have another idea. If it does really well, we'll go back to it and it's fine. 
so they get very set in their ways. So that that's always yeah. a, a pretty tough thing to deal with. with well, even you and I, we we have a weird Western series with Blackstone. I'll write thirty of those books. Like if this could be the next Dresden Files, I'm in. Right? It's <laughs> Dresden meets The Witcher in the Wild West, and it's it's perfect for those people. But we have three books with them. And there's the chance that we get to three books, and even if it's a success, they go, we're not moving on past four books. But we've learned, we're, we don't, we didn't plan four, five, and six, right? Yeah. Like, we're, we're not planning that because we're not gonna set us up for heartbreak. But a lot of authors, and I'm probably talking to authors in the room that go, oh, we have an epic fan, I have this epic fantasy, it's 18 books long, and it follows this character and that character. So we, That's, we have to discuss that with our authors. The thing is, is that they're looking at outliers, like yes. the big name, huge fantasy authors as examples and that they're outliers for a reason. An 18 book series <coughs> from a debut author is of a lot less value to us than a three book series that's manageable. That could maybe grow into that, but isn't something that's gonna be expected. Especially when it comes to, we do audio a lot as well. 18 books on audio, those books better be selling really well. <laughs> to be earning that back, because that's an expensive medium. Um, you know, and, uh, and going with the particularities of authors, is editing is a huge, huge issue. And when you get to the amount of books we do, we have so many editors on staff that do different types of editing. Traditional authors tend to be used to a certain style of editing, because the big four is a certain style. We don't have as many of those. Indie authors all want different things. And many don't want editing at all. Yeah, we go for And those are the ones that need editing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we go for people who want their book to be butchered, which is a much longer, more expensive editing job, which is fine, to people who like to, they don't want a word change, even though their book's 200,000 words long, and it- And it's got William Shatner commas everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> right? it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be that long. Typically, maybe they're bigger names or something, but, and they'll get angry if you change it. So, you know, like, a lot of these things become custom. All these deals, all these things with different authors are custom for us, which makes, you know, it's a lot of work, but everyone expects different things. And as a small press, you really don't get the power of like a random house to say, no, this is how we do editing. You know, you don't, that doesn't come with us. They, they you know, you're working for them sometimes and in their mind, not vice versa. So they want it to be what they want. I'll tell you, we've gotten emails that I would never even consider sending to one of my publishers. Uh, we've experienced some of, I mean, again, uh, it's, it's, it, you can divorce yourself from the emotions of things, but I can't. So, you know, 1 a.m., I'm just checking my email, right? Because, by the way, when you're a small publisher, it never ends. If, if you let it end, you're gonna fail. And, and my wife had to learn that very difficult to wake up. My phone, when I was a pastor, was not even with me during a Sunday morning church service. Now I have an artist in Poland and an artist in Argentina and an editor in such and such, and those are the times they are able to work. So my phone is on my lap, and she asked me one time, sort of early on, she's like, why are you working during church? I'm like, because it's the only time I can. If this guy doesn't get the answers he needs right now, no. he literally won't get those answers because the next time he's gonna be available for that is gonna be church next week. Because he works nine to five, you know, Monday through Friday, and Saturday and Sunday are art days, and you just have to be available. And sometimes we have to go. We've got an author in New Zealand that has to talk to us, and the only time he could do it is two a.m. our time, and like or his time, or his, yeah. you know, right? <laughs> and so th and these are things also to think about. Now, if you're looking at like ten books a year, these are these are not as big a deal. But you know, like for us, I mean, it's not artists, authors, agents, partners in audio or print all over the world, proofers even, and some of like the agents or people working, at, like like you said, if you don't answer them then, or take a call then, they're gonna be like, all right, next time is two weeks. Yeah. We're not a corporation, and, and honestly, um, well I guess we technically are a corporation. <laughs> but we're Which by the way, if you're an author and you're making money, like be a corporation, because it's way better. Right. Uh, so do that. <laughs> uh, but the point I'm making is that like we are not a bunch. We're not a bunch of people that work nine to five. This is this is our lives, and we have devoted it to making sure that authors are successful in whatever capacity they can be successful. Um, and our, our our wives are with us, and they're very happy, right? Because they understand what we're doing. And I think being here with us this year has really helped them see the impact that we've had on the community. And like, generally, it's all smiles. But it's not always all smiles. Um, 
And so if you're looking at like, again, the, the quick money, nine to five, it's not, this is not it. This is not it at all. You cannot check out of this industry. Yeah, books are movies. There's not as much money in books as movies and people kind of, even like tabletop RPG games or anything like that, like books are it's 99 cents sometimes. You get 35% of that split up by two or K reads, which is however many small cents. Plus giving reads. it to the author, right? Then there's author royalties on top of that. Think about what you're making right now and then realize you've got to pay your authors something. <laughs> um, we have tremendous royalties. Uh, I, I don't think there's an author we have that would argue that we have author-friendly royalties. I would suggest to you, do better than Trad Pub because these authors understand, they have friends in the community telling them what they're able to make if they do it on their own. Again, remember, most authors don't know how to do it on their own. But I have one success with them and then watch them go try to do it on their own. We've seen that over and over again. We had to, we didn't want to have in our contract any kind of right to first refusal or anything like that because we effing hate it as authors when we have to do that, but we, and we had to add it because we'd have tremendous success where we dropped $50,000 into something and then the next thing we know, they're going off trying it on their own and we're like, well, shit, I just wasted a whole lot of efforts. Um, every one of them have come back to us, by the way. Most. I think, I think everyone, I think everyone. No, maybe not. <laughs> Rhett knows better. Why don't we open up to questions? Is that okay? Yeah, what time is Wow, that was full no, shot. That was in a holster. You mentioned, you mentioned you work with authors from New Zealand or from yes. overseas. Um, what do these authors find in you? What is the service that you offer that is attractive to them? Because they say, I'm gonna sign with these guys 12 times a week. We sell a shit ton of books. <laughs> if you go on sci-fi fantasy top 100, you will see our bird on 25%, 30% of everything. Okay. Our little bird, this is what I mean when I say our bird. And I mean, it also depends on what the author is, yeah. is personally after, right? Because we're, we're valuable to different people for different reasons. Agreed. If you're a total debut, probably the most value we have is marketing and actually selling your book. If you're not, if you're someone who's, who's pretty prolific and you write a lot of books, maybe our best value is actually scheduling and planning out your career for you in the most optimal ways to sell on Amazon and Audible and all the other places. Because if you're writing that much and you're not experiencing it, you're probably not gonna do it the right way or you know, be overwhelmed by it. So you, it really depends on the author. Do you button a lot of them? Address that question a little bit. Rick, can do, you mind, do you mind if he adds something to that? Uh, Sir? Uh, All right, we'll go ahead. I, I was a, in, in, the, in the indie world, I was a fairly successful author, author before Aethon, but I am sure you all know this, the marketing game changes constantly. And keeping up with it is a full-time job on top of the full-time job of writing. So if you plan to do this for a living and you want to do it on your own, what you've basically taken is two full-time jobs. And as much, you know, as prolific as you have to be as a writer to make a living as an indie writer, adding the job of marketing to that is backbreaking sometimes. So for me, having someone who can do marketing, who's smart at marketing, who I can trust, as opposed to say paying someone to do my marketing and then hoping to God that they don't just waste my money or steal my money, because you're giving them access to your Amazon account and everything. Having someone who can do this, you can trust, trust is a big thing, and who's competent at it, it's, it's a huge, huge offer. But you're one of them. Yeah, one of our offers. So, so how, how did you find, how did you come to that conclusion? What did you see? Did you know them personally? Was yeah, I, I knew them, I knew them. I, I wasn't like, I didn't live in the same city, but I, I had met them personally at 20 books. And talked Here, to them. Right, I, had friends, I had friends who uh, were published with them. They told me they could, that they were trustworthy and they did a good job. So. Okay. And I, I went, went, I did one series with them first. You know, just said, I'm gonna give them this series I'm gonna see how it turns out, and if it's if it doesn't do go well, it's just one series, <coughs> you know. Which that's a lot of work, but I write pretty fast, so that was you know six months of work or something for for the series. But you know, it turned out really well, and they are trustworthy. The that's the biggest thing for me because I could probably make you know close to what I make now if I was good at marketing, but I would be just mentally exhausted all the time. Yeah, I think. 
Rick is also a perfect example of scheduling and planning. Uh, we signed him and had that first success. Like he was down with us to do everything, and we kind of set a career guide for like two years of a book for like every month coming out, taking advantage of backlists and new stuff and going back and forth and really building his name out. And that that's something that is not every author can do because they're not willing to give you everything, but he trusts them out enough to really like plan out two years of author career with them. <coughs> that answer your question? Great. Chris? All right, so I've had this conversation with you guys several times, and Steve and I talked a little bit about this on Monday. Can y'all speak a little bit to the, how easy it is to sour your brand with Amazon if you don't sell well, if you don't launch well and all that, and then their algorithms take your name and throw it in the trash can. The idea, what Steve and I were talking about was the idea of possibly starting up a pseudonym with Brandon and Lisa, a pseudonym to sort of you know, clear the sciences of Amazon. Can you all speak a little bit about the dangers of that? Because it's sort of a follow-up to Rick's commentary that if you give it, if you give your books to somebody that knows what they're doing, um, you can minimize the possibilities of that happening. So can you all talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so I gear, gear it toward the marketing or the publishing side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the author. Amazon really values consistency, and so does Audible, probably even more so. And you know that that's just how it is. It's like Amazon wants to see your books. Are we selling? If one doesn't, the system's like, well, why not? And then it doesn't recommend you maybe to the same people because it's like, well, no one wants to read them anymore. It's not a, a smart system, but it is. And so you know something that we do a lot is if we really like working with an author, but either with us or their past career, their name, like they just haven't been selling, or maybe they sold a little bit on Amazon, but on Audible, like just never sold, and their data looks really bad. Rebuilding careers with pseudonyms and pen names to really refresh the data is something that we've done a, a lot of, and sometimes that's not an easy conversation with authors. It'll be new people we sign, and we really like their new thing, and we're like, but you know, this probably is gonna fail on audio, and there's no reason it should, so why don't we try a pen name to sort of build you up? So those are just some of like the conversations that can be tough with authors, but pen names are <coughs> kind of important in a data-driven world because that's where all the data is being linked to, is your name, cell, and ownership. In the back? Yeah, so just some round numbers. So an author comes to you with a book, says, we well, publish this, you read it, you like it, okay, we'll, 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 we'll take you on. What kind of uh, investment do you think you'll do in that book before you start selling in just a round number, and what kind of royalty rates in that corporation? It's good. I, I don't know that we can answer. Of course, you said round numbers, so we're going to ballpark some things, right? Because everything we're very custom. We're uh, new authors look a lot different than established authors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Um, but you are looking at an investment of probably thousands of dollars in a series with a with a with a, a new author. Um, Probably like five to ten thousand to launch. From five to ten thousand to launch a series. Now, anyone who's written a series, you might go, "Well, I do it a whole lot less than that." That's fine. I don't care. <laughs> we do it right. Um, <laughs> we do it right. You know, part of it, like we sold you trust in us. So we're gonna, even if it fails, we're going to do our best to try to sell. It. Now, over the years, a lot of that we, involves money. Right. You know? We've over the years we have established relationships with industry people like artists and editors and narrators who trust us and we provide them enough work that we go okay can we reduce the cost of each thing but keep you more consistent because the reality is not every book makes back what we put into it we know that from the start but that's like what Rhett said earlier is that somebody starting a publisher may not be prepared for the failures when we first started I looked at every series as did this series earn out was there an ROI I can't do that anymore I've written checks for $11 for a quarter, and then I've written checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars for a quarter to one person. If I were to look at the $11, I'd probably be in a closet crying, right? Like I, and, and, and many times, all, a lot of those are ones that we went to the author and went, listen, this probably isn't gonna sell, but we'll help you. Um, we are willing to do that because we put ourselves in a position where we're able to do that. Not everything needs to be a hit. Not everything can be a hit right. because subgenres are really important. Subgenres are important. Uh, when it comes, you asked about royalties as well. Um, obviously, we can't share much about royalties. They're higher than standard, but that's going to change deal to deal. Um, 
someone that is experienced as in, they're going to get a different deal than someone who's brand new, um, but they are higher than industry standard for sure. But we're also really good at like honoring our authors. If we start them out low because they're new and they come back to us with a new series and they've been successful, we increase their royalties most yeah, of the time said, without them asking. I just did a contract this morning where we went up like 15% with an author that was a hit for us. And why? Because we, again, we're authors first. It's very hard for an author to come to their publisher and say, can I have more money? So typically we like to do it before they have to make that decision to ask us. Uh, if or before we, they leave because they think they can't get it That's anymore. fair too, yeah. Because a lot of people don't think you can negotiate. And, and again, that comes down, a lot of authors come to us because they not only don't know marketing, they literally can't. They can't stomach the idea of trying to sell their things. And that's very similar to, like, they, some people don't negotiate. Some people don't even really, re, they just sign the contract. Like, like Rick over there. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, I'd have gone up to 95%. No, I'm kidding. But like, like some, some people just don't know that they, that they can negotiate, and you, know, you always can. And that's part of why we, we really do have custom tailored deals for everyone. Every author is different, every subgenre is different. And it may be like, if we tried to put everything in a box of certain deals, it, it wouldn't really work at all. And that, you know, that's. Big Four can do that. We as flexible indies can't do that. Rhett's contract guy, because Rhett is from New York and is a shark. <laughs> and I'm over here like, you want 80%? It's fine. Let's just take 80%. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how to, I'm not good at negotiating. Um, I, I don't like the price. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, and, and you know what? As a, as a small publisher, you're going to get the authors that are like, hey, I can't pay my bills this month. Instead of paying me in two months, could you pay me today? Right, it's like the buy me a burger, whatever, I'll pay you on Tuesday. Like, it's like, we, we, we didn't get paid for yours yet. How are we gonna, we're gonna pay you? And, and you have to be able to know when you can. Man, when we first started, uh, paying somebody a couple of grand, we, we might not have been able to pay the bills at the end of the month. Today, thank you God, we're in a better position, but like, when you first start out, it's, it is tough. Unless, I don't know, unless magic happens for you. I think there was a question back there. So you guys have talked a lot about data and when you're marketing the book, you know, Amazon's gonna take into account everything, what your cover, the blurb, all that's gotta be on point. So then when you get to the targeting, Amazon's algos will feed in, okay, these people like military science fiction, let it sit up other people like, right? With that being said, the biggest change I've seen in marketing the past year to two years has been the cost with AMS. Right, it's just skyrocketing. There's no barrier to entry. You really don't have to do the right ad copy. Right? Um, have you guys seen that? And if so, with all the investment you put into new authors coming in, has that changed your marketing tactics? Because you went from being able to, you know, bid forty cents a click to now seventy-five cents to a dollar just to get seen. I think we. Oh, I was just gonna say. I think somebody said. Well, it doesn't matter. Go ahead. Well, obviously during the holidays it's worse. I think AMS even actually put a little warning up there that. It's worse during holidays now. Um, ads are very interesting. You know, we we use them a lot. We typically spend the most on launching a book and, and upfront stuff because two years from now, a backlist on ads, maybe you can make it sell, but you're not gonna make it sell enough to make a dent in anything. And you know, if you're only relying on selling on AMS ads, it's probably not gonna work because they are extremely fickle and hard to manage. Um, for everyone, I know a lot of best-selling authors who can't get them to work either, and they tend to just work on things that are already selling anyway. Um, as far as prices going up, we are an ROI type publisher. We don't have, when we sign this book, we'll send this, we're gonna spend this much, we can't go over that. We'll spend as much as we need to on certain things, and we don't break it down that way. So it's honestly something that, yes, they're up, but it's not, anything we really pay attention. We spend gonna, it because we have to gonna, spend it. You know, if that's what it costs, that's what it costs. Every promo site that exists, you know, prices go up $100 every year too. And they like everything. work even less every time. Yeah, the, the longer these <laughs> things, the book bug, a book bug promo, three years ago I would get one, maybe three, 4,000 sales. We just got one, 600. Yeah. Um, we just had a free one yesterday. It used to be 60,000 reads. It was what, 10,000 free downloads. These and that one went to number 12 in on the freeze. Yeah, so it's not like anyone else is doing better, but all these promo sites get more expensive and less effective. 
and you know we know a lot of them, we use a lot of them, and you just kind of have to, no matter what the cost is really, because that, those are the options. I wanna do a disclaimer caveat uh, for just a second. I want you to remember you're in a place where there are seven figure authors, there are one figure authors, and you're gonna talk to a lot of people here, and you're gonna get differentiating, uh, 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 Differing answers is probably the best way to say it. You're gonna to talk to an author that, that maybe thinks they're selling because of their ads. They might not be selling because of their ads. And just keep that in mind sort of as you're talking to people because um, it's sometimes hard to know why something is selling. Uh, and yeah, if you're one author, you don't have the benefit We've got like 700 books, right? Like pool, we know yeah. what, we have data pools and we have data pools across best selling and no selling and we, we can, Figure those things out, and as a publisher, again, you can't rely on asking, don't even rely on us. Like, honestly, don't even listen to us. It's gonna be different in your market. You don't have the fan base. I've, we've got readers that buy every book that we ever publish and read them, right? Like, we've built this establishment that um, it, it's helped us over the years. You're not gonna have the same exact situation if you decide to do it, and you're gonna be tempted to quit a lot uh, we didn't have the opportunity to quit. Because <laughs> we quit our jobs. We quit our jobs. <laughs> I'm out. Yes, sir. Um, I'm one of these guys that's talking about starting a publishing company, but totally different genre and everything. So, but, oh, yeah. I'll give you all the answers. <laughs> all right. Right. <laughs> a lot of that, this stuff, like we're signed for selling things, like we know how to sell science fiction and fantasy. It's going to be different methods. Yeah, yeah. good. Now, but my real question is it sounds like you guys are doing so much work. It sounds like you've been very successful. But I'm just curious, like, how do you work together? Are you guys remote in different cities? He's in Delaware. I'm in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. And also, like, uh, I'm sure you're managing this, but I would, how do I put this? Like, a lot of people would be worried about burning out. Like, you know, it's just the number of things you're dealing, 200 books a year, two guys. I wrote six books last year. Okay. And right? Right. Right. <laughs> right. And two, two small kids, babies, right? And I'm not saying that's a brag. We might burn out, but that's why we're in Vegas right now. And that's why you haven't seen us at this conference the whole time. <laughs> with our wives, yeah. eating food, and taking a break from this and trying not to talk about books. Right. Being honest. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to be thinking well, like like three years from now, would I want to have five other people that they can handle this, this no, it's 10 a.m. Sunday? We don't trust anyone. Okay. We don't trust anyone. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I write a lot less than I used to, for sure, but like, look, we're here, and one of our biggest yeah. releases of the year is what about Tuesday? Tuesday, yesterday. That, okay. We had to wake up and work on it, even though we're here, so it is just constant work. Uh, but I mean, it's a great question. I, we just don't trust anyone. Um, we have tried over the years. Yeah. Um, we, it's hard to get employees that like. Well, it's our business. The same if thing. We understand. like, like if, if we don't upload book on Friday, Amazon shuts our account down. Right? Like, the, the, there's specific things that I can't trust somebody else to do because it's not their livelihood. Yeah. The same way it's my livelihood, although I'm paying them. If they screw up, it's like, ah, oh, I screwed up. If I, if I screw up, at least it was me that screwed it up or, or Brent that screwed it up. And so we can trust people with editing books. We can trust people with fill in the blanks. Art, no, I don't trust anyone with art, right? Because like I've learned over the years, most people don't know what good book covers are. They might know what good art is, but good art doesn't make a good book cover. A good book cover is a good book cover. There's contrast, there's, there's the thumbnail is all that matters. I don't care if it looks like crap at a big picture. If that thumbnail looks good and it makes people stop and buy the book because your book sell, your, your, your cover sells your story, not your book, right? And most authors go, well, I want this scene and I go, don't get the scene, I don't want the camera. You move your go. I have a question. Yeah. I wasn't um, no, I'm kidding, I'm joking. I love that you guys stick to sci-fi because that's what you know and that's what you're good at and you don't get into all the different genres. Um, so what do you recommend for somebody who is looking to possibly do publishing for other authors? I'm not an author. Um, do publishing for other authors in different genres than what you do. Like what was, like you have the author experience, but what's some of the research that relationships. you need to do? Relationships. Everything is relationships. Okay. Rhett, everyone in the sci-fi and fantasy community owned owed Rhett a favor before we started it. <laughs> Rhett, Rhett ran something called Sci-Fi Bridge, which is a free promotional. Uh, still runs it. Or still runs it. Uh, it runs it with Chris, actually. Um, they ran it. They, they, it was free. It still is free. It will never not be free. You've got things like BookBub and Discover Sci-Fi, and although we love those things, they're very, very expensive. 
Rhett and Chris's deal gets just about the same sales rates as some of these things and it's free. And why do we do that? Because then we can go, hey brother, can you help me out? Yeah, I mean relationships are gonna be everything in publishing unless like you're selling on a five million dollar war chest to throw into ads and most people aren't. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So you have you have no employees, correct? Okay. You only have like contracted like we um, have one employee. One employee and, and everyone's and a couple of artists that like that are on retainer, on retainer. and editors on retainer, stuff like that. How did you start to learn about Was that it? Those? That's it. Wait. 45. Yeah. <laughs> Ask us we'll out. Be outside. We'll be outside. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.